guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Genevieve Johnson. I'm the coordinator for the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And welcome to our webinar series on landscape conservation design, where we're looking at different components of this process and different products related to this process. Um, today, we are speaking with Steve Traxler, is the coordinator from the Peninsula, Peninsula Florida LCC on how they used scenario planning in their landscape conservation design. Um, Steve and his team have been doing this work for several years now and um, we're very lucky to be able to learn from what they've done as we move forward here in the desert LCC as well. Um, with Steve, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, thanks Genevieve. And I don't know what talk a little bit about some management questions and some things that we've used the scenarios for and a number of spin um, the, the, the scenarios and then lastly a little bit about some communication methods um, that we've used. So what happened um, back in 2008 we just come out that didn't let us talk much about climate change. We allowed to talk about climate change again and um, the uh, I work at the S office and the, the, the project lead for the S office um, turned a number of us loose to, to kind of look into climate change and and, that, and I've been working on Everglades restoration well, for a long time, about 15 years. At the same time, I also work on adaptive management and I was at a meeting and I met these, these guys from, from MIT and USGS and they had this really cool um, science impact collaborative referred to as MUSIC, MIT USGS Science Impact Collaborative. We talked for a while and I really would want to do something on adaptive management and maybe climate change. And um, Paul Sousa really wanted to do something um, where he uh, where he gave back to the refuge system. He really thought that, that the refuge system, everybody was talking about climate change. The refuge system back then really wanted to know what they needed to monitor. And uh, so we talked to the guys from, from USGS and MIT and, and so kind of in a project overview, they, um, they wanted to simulate the possible effects of climate change and population growth um, using scenario planning, these different trajectories, trajectories in South Florida. They also wanted to, to kind of look at, you know, what this would mean for a, a number of uh, strategic habitat conservation areas. All right. Okay. All right. So, like I was saying, the refuge system, they really want to know what to study on the refuges. And Florida has a number of refuges. As you can see, many of them are coastal and they're small. And, and so, and so after, after talking with the MIT guys and, and talking with, with the refuge system, we, we were narrowing it down to they really wanted to focus on climate change issues. And so we had some, some issues in Florida, sea level rise being the predominant one. This slide clearly shows that sea level rise over the last 100 years roughly has come up nine inches. But in the last 15 years, um, since 2000 roughly to today, uh, sea level rise has come up roughly four inches. By the way, this is, this is what's taking it out of the kind of the linear phase of sea level rise and possibly putting us into the accelerated, which makes things like one meter by 2100 or maybe even two meters plausible. And this is a really interesting shot from the University of the Miami Herald in 2016 during one of the King Tide events. We, we get King Tide events now in South Florida. Um, almost four, five, six times a year, there's an octopus in a parking garage and in Miami, I think it's the Marine World sending out a reconnaissance force to look for new habitat. All right, here's some other effects. These are downtown Miami and Fort Lauderdale showing king tides. So as you can see, sea level rise is a real issue. And when we started talking to the refugees, they were kind of curious on, on, on what could happen to them. And so with a meter of sea level rise, this is what could happen. As we could see, it's, it's huge effects for some of the refugees. Ding Darling, with one meter is 95%. 70% um, of Everglades uh, National Park goes underwater, 80% of key deer. So, so it, it truly is a, a big issue. At the same time, we want to explain to them that, you know, climate change would be interesting, but Florida's under a, another huge threat, and that's total population growth. And so here's two projections for 2020 and 2060. Um, today, we currently, we're almost at 2020, and we have almost 21 million people in Florida. We're going to go up to about 31 million people by 2060. And there's a recent report that came out. We're looking at like 33 plus million people by 2070. And the, the red areas are showing where the focus is. So much of the focus is going to be along the coastal communities and especially in central and south Florida. Uh, and, and in fact, 
Um, there's a corridor from Tampa to Daytona. And if you see my cursor, follow it along. That corridor right there, the I-4 corridor, is effectively kind of cutting Florida into two pieces, a north and a south piece. So if you're a, a large rain, range migratory mammal, you might have some, some problems um, being able to migrate back and forth. So at the same time, back in 2008, you know, a lot of, a lot of ton of work was being done, and, um, but there was a challenge with downscaling. The models weren't anywhere near where they were nowadays, but we had to go with some of the best available science. And as you can see from this, um, the challenge was is there was a lot of uncertainty um, and, and relatively quickly in the models. They, they've actually done a great job since then on really um, reducing that uncertainty. And then the dilemma in South Florida is it was a, there was a number of, of issues. Um, many of these drivers of change transcended a, a number of geographies. The institutions in, in our part of the world, they really weren't designed to handle these rapidly changing um, sea level rise temperature and precipitation predictions, as well as the, the very real um, uh, changes in population. And hundreds of organiz organizations were involved, multiple jurisdictions, and so using scenarios was one way of being able to communicate across many of these areas, these, these different agencies and jurisdictions, to talk about what the future could look like. So some of our early lessons, we, we, we really had to, to to kind of work with some of the stakeholders. These are, these are very heavily stakeholder based. Um, we wanted to define a, a really critical problem. And then, and then the other thing is to understand the small scale, which is what the refuge level was, we first had to really understand the large scale, which would be all of South Florida. And so the first thing we did is, you know, being, <laughs> being rather interesting, we, we, we gave the wrong stakeholder group to the gentleman from USGS and MIT. Uh, we actually, we gave them a stakeholder group referred to as a, a Fish and Wildlife Service Eco Team made up of primarily refuge managers and um, ES staff. And what we really wanted to do was expand that significantly. And so, so what they did from about 2008 to about 2010, they worked on developing the scenarios with the eco team, uh, but they also went in, they really tore apart a lot of information. They, they looked at um, historical and thematic mapping of South Florida. They took a number of inventories, a model inventory, species inventories. They tore apart all the management plans for all the refuges and the park service. And then they, they did some institutional and decision-making diagram, and I'll get back to that later. And the other thing they did is they were really good at communicating what could happen. And, and, and what I learned about scenario planning, when, you, when you're talking about scenario planning in front of managers that aren't familiar with it, you probably need to go over it two or three times for them to really really understand it. And so what, the, what, what, what Dr. Vargas came up real early um, in the beginning was a cartoon. As I stepped to this cartoon, you see some, some green areas, which are, which are um, highlighted the parks and refuges in South Florida. And it doesn't really matter what amount of sea level rise, but some type of sea level rise, climate change is going to affect South Florida. You're going to see, start seeing the, the, the kind of, um, I guess that's a purplish color, pink, whatever, is, uh, that's where the new urbanization is going to occur. And then you're going to get, you're going to get a loss of some of the natural areas. You're going to get some to migrate. And then there's going to be new corridors formed and, and new natural areas. And to anticipate where those new natural areas are, that's kind of the real beauty of conservation planning in the future when you have these rapidly changing environments. So you have to be able to make that prediction, and then you have to come up with some type of incentive to go out and be able to, to realize how we, how we put those areas into conservation. And, and the nice thing about this type of scenario planning is we see these conflict zones, these areas where urbanization and future con conservation and sea level rise are all going all gonna to overlay each other and, and conflict. And so we know, you know, where we got to focus. So the approach is going to be each stakeholder base. Like I said, we, we saddled them right away with the wrong stakeholder group. It was all Fish and Wildlife Service people and a few USGS people. And so what the, what the, what the gentlemen, what they really want to do is they, they realize that they needed a much broader stakeholder group, federal, state, local agencies, all right? But, the, but they also, and, and, they, and they realized that they, they were going to, you know, through analysis and synthesis, they were going to develop these alternative fu futures with the stakeholders. And then they were going to go through, but, but that wasn't, that's really important. And we could come up with a number of scenarios on our own right now. But one of the real kickers to the methodology they use is to be able to take those scenarios and do simulation modeling with those scenarios and really describe where the impacts are. And then use the scenarios to go through and determine, okay, what, what methods of conservation would then could be utilized to help put some of these areas where these impacts occur in the conservation. 
And so being stakeholder based, you know, we had to, we had all these Fish and Wildlife Service, Refuge, ES people involved. But we realized that we really needed were the people, the groups, the, the, the agencies tasked with implementation and substantial knowledge to contribute. So if you know that urbanization and development is one of your critical groups, you really need to bring some developmental people in. If you know that a lot of the work should be done at the county level, you need to bring in the county people. Um, so we need to provide um, the expert and, 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 and we needed the experts and then at the same time, we needed to make it relevant. And so between 2008 and 2010, we held a series of focal meetings and workshops. I think it was five stakeholder based workshops and literally, uh, I don't know, 50 to 100 stakeholder or focal meetings with these experts and with these managers. A lot of contact hours. And then the other thing, one way, we, so how do we determine though which of those people to go out and get? And so we took the eco team, we took the refuge managers, and we took some of the key ES managers, and we did a, did a process called influence diagramming. And we said, okay, who affects you? And it was, it was really enlightening. In an hour with these very simple influence diagram computer programs, you can talk to the refuge manager or the project lead and quickly have them map who influences them. And, and then they started realizing, oh, okay, this is a much broader group of stakeholders. And you, we would start categorizing and picking out which of these key influencers on these refuge areas did we make sure we have to invite to the meetings. All right, then they set up a process. And so this framework I'm going to go through and kind of show. So there were these six pillars or, or, or areas that they really wanted to focus on. Um, hydrology, population, climate, uh, the trust resources, strategic habitats, and then the institutions. And then of those, we had a number of different parameters. And so they started making different parameters. There are climate change parameters, et cetera. And think about it. Every parameter you add exponentially increases the number of your scenarios. And so we developed a number of scenarios. And you start seeing there's, there's these scenarios. We end up with about 8,000 scenarios. But that's not realistic to analyze. And so there are 8,000 possible. And then we kind of got them down to eventually, we got it down to what we call the plausible number of scenarios. And that, and, or feasible number of scenarios. Plot went from went from possible to plausible to feasible. And in the end, really, you, you, you really it's hard to analyze more than about 10. We got it down to eventually um, a handful of scenarios. They use the Delphi methodology um, and all these consultations to reinforce what the scenarios were, and they developed the scenarios. We got it down to a group of five, and then these scenarios would be assessed through some ecological tools, through those impact assessments. Um, the modeling in, in, in Florida is called Critical Land and Water Identification Modeling, a project which basically is, is a number of species models. And so that was the process that they used throughout the whole project. It was amazing. We could take it down from 8,000 scenarios down to about five realistic scenarios for half of South Florida. There's dimensions that they use. So they, they like multi-parameter scenarios. They were on four dimensions. So I mentioned climate change. Focus was sea level rise. But at the same time, we also um, explored temperature and precipitation. I talked about population projections. The other thing they wanted to do is realistically to what kind of financial resources were available for conservation, which is a really important part of this. And then the fourth parameter was, was planning assumptions. It, it, and I'll, I'll, I'll cover that a little more. But these were things like policy changes, you know, proactive versus a kind of a business as usual for urbanization. All right, so just to cover a couple of these real quick. Um, Land acquisition in Florida had, a, had between 2001 and 2010, had gone from a very small amount of money up to 300 million. Um, that held for a couple of years and then dropped back down to almost nothing. So they used um, kind of the area under the curve, that kind of money and, and kind of had a, had a low, low financial and a high financial um, way of looking. And then many people, when I talk to them in conservation, think you just throw more money at conservation um, all, all the good things you need to do will be done, but that's not exactly true. And so when, when we also talked about those policy assumptions, you know, these different densities of, of, of developments, business as usual, which currently in Florida is kind of a pro sprawl, um, not really uh, well, well planned at times, letting people go where they want to go. In fact, we have about, we have about 400,000 people a year coming to Florida. That's like inviting a big chunk of the state of Wyoming to move into our state every year. And, and just to give you an idea, we actually have a development on the books um, for roughly 500,000 people, one development. 
Um, so many of you aren't quite faced with those kind of urbanization processes. Proactive densities are, are a lot different, um, uh, kind of um, bringing more people together. So taking these spaces where urbanization is already occurring and going primarily up or tighter densities rather than out. Um, so this, this is the type of these proactive densities that allow us to be able to get to folks in other areas for conservation. And so what they did is they did what's called an alternative future simulation process. So they knew that for every parcel and, and, and pixel, we were, we were using 100 meter, meter pixels, there would be a demand for those pixels and an attractiveness. An attractiveness to either conservation or an attractiveness to, to development or to maybe a change in, in, in um, agriculture, either ranching or, um, or some type of other farming, um, primarily citrus and smoke crop. And so, and so that's the simulation process that will come together is, you know, whether you're in a business as usual or whether you're in a proactive, the demand for each of those pixels. And so the conservation strategies then would be to, to acquire currently the most valuable areas for conservation, identify and acquire future suitable habitat, and then lastly, you know, to connect those, those existing patches. So, so as our, our, our landscape changes down here, um, and uh, as some of these conservation areas migrate, usually in and, and north, you know, how can we identify the new ones, and then how we, can we get the species and habitats work from where they currently are to those new areas. And so this is kind of a schematic of South Florida of, of how this could occur. So time period starting out, you, you, you try and protect all the priority areas in, in conflict with potential urban development. And so as you can watch, the green areas are, are, are where some of these occur. The um, purplish pink zones are going to be where new urbanization. And so you want to ensure habitat core areas around it, what's called the EA, that was a big farming area. And then we're adding some, some new green areas in the south. And then from 2020 to 2040, we're adding more um, corridor areas. So as you can see, you get some larger green areas. And then from 2060, we really get into adding some interior habitat corridor areas, trying to connect up the corridors. This is how you, know, you can migrate um, large landscapes. And then in the end, we're connecting all the remaining large patch areas. And so, that, so the lighter green areas are previously um, existing conservation areas, and, and the darker greens are some of the new areas. And then you can see um, some of the conservation areas. So that, that was the theoretical. And so of our five scenarios, um, scenario C and B were kind of like bookends. They were the scenarios that were furthest apart. Scenario C had high sea level rise, low finances, coast sprawl or a business as usual, and a doubling of the population, so roughly ending with up to 31 million people. Scenario B had lower sea level rise, um, a lot of conservation funding, a proactive or non-sprawl approach, so higher densities, and kind of a trend population, which was different. As we go through time, 2020, 2040, and 2060, we start to see that scenario B can get, can get to those patches, those large green areas that we need to, to connect up South Florida. And, and, and what was really interesting is when we delved into and really broke it apart, a lot of that was because um, the policy assumptions, those, those going to a proactive um, um, kind of future uh, urbanization and, and working with, with a lot of the farming agriculture communities um, would actually get you more results than just throwing financial resources. Obviously, finances helped, but those policy assumptions would, would, would get us all, a lot further. And so then, so that, so those scenarios, we finished those in around 2011 ish, 2010, 2011. Between 2011 and 2014, we migrated those scenarios to cover the rest of Florida. All right. But those, the previous scenarios, the South Florida ones, had very widely differing parameters. We had, during that time, the, the Peninsula Florida LCC had, had been developed. And when we talked to our, our steering committee, what they really wanted to do was use the scenarios to answer some very specific management questions. So they held a lot of those parameters constant. We held development at about 31 million people. We held climate change at one meter. And what they really wanted to look at is the difference between fee simple purchase and easements. Because a number of groups in Florida felt that a lot of the land that could already be fee simple purchased probably had, and easements were gonna be one of the big critical tools of the future. And so, although when you look at the green areas on these maps, you know, it doesn't look like there's, there's great differences when you drill in and actually get down to the 100 meter level, um, almost the parcel size, 
you can actually see some large differences. And so um, putting things in 10% fee simple and 90% easement um, would actually get you a better results than, than being able to buy everything because your money goes further. And at that time then, what was also going on, so, so, so we ended up with these statewide scenarios. So we've had half of Florida scenarios and then we'll end up with statewide scenarios. We had a lot of conversations and a number of spin-off projects happening. And so this is kind of really interesting. During that whole process from 2010 to today, we, we've had oh, probably 10 to 20 spin-off projects. In 2011, we had a really good vulnerability assessment that was used, a combination of the MIT guys um, working with defenders. Um, these are a handful of some of the species. As you can see, many of the species are, are highly vulnerable uh, to, to climate change. No surprise there. Um, at the same time, um, a new refuge is being proposed, the Everglades Headwaters Refuge. We use the scenarios to help um, look at, after they've done drawn some of these lines, we, we've also done some work with the scenarios to focus in those areas on where the conservation and fee simple um, purchases probably need to occur. They're, they're in the very early stages. Um, they're allowed up to 50,000 acres of fee simple and 100,000 acres of easements in an area of over 600,000 acres. And at this point in time, they only have a few thousand acres already in the refuge. So, so we've helped work with them with, with the scenarios and with some other methods of, of where they might want to approach or, or focus next. Um, down in the Florida Keys, there was a, a state employee that really got interested in the scenarios and he wanted to focus in on some marine work. And so he wanted to focus in on some specific species work, the spiny lobster, um, the, the um, loggerhead turtle, and the goliath grouper. This is some spiny lobster work. They, they, they ran slam modeling for all the keys and then took the scenarios that we had developed, <coughs> done some overlays with those, and then took these species models and, and really looked hard future projections of, of how some of these species um, would work. And they also did a second round with additional species. Um, at the same time, that was about the time where refuges, I think around 2014, were being told that they had to do a landscape conservation design. Um, related to any new land acquisition areas. And so we were working with one of the refuges in South Florida, the Panther Refuge, and we were using the scenarios to, to help with an impact assessment on that refuge to ultimately, um, the impact assessment ultimately helped them generate their, their landscape conservation design. So for Florida Panther, um, this is some of the, the basic work we did. We looked at a lot more species than just the Panther um, to help them out with that impact analysis in their LCD. And then these are these are some things that are the things that, that we're having trouble capturing though in the impact assessment. Uh, we're actually having trouble um, some of the panther mortality and some of the roads. I mean, you talk about really really tiny small scale, and so that's hard to capture in this kind of impact assessment. Um, but we're still we're able to use some of the existing panther models to get around that. Um, and then in around 2015, um, there there are. Uh, the, the Obama administration, I guess it was 2014, came out with a priority agenda, enhancing the climate resilience for America's natural resources. Um, this, this generated seven pilot areas of the resilient land and water pilot projects. And um, one of the pilot areas that was selected was Southwest Florida. We, we were already working with Panther Refuge on the LCD. And so we, we came in and, and we worked again with, with Geoadaptive and Geodesign to help with this resilience project. It was really cool. The rollout for that project was actually at the White House um, in 2016, so it was kind of exciting to actually have a project where you got to talk about it at the White House. And, um, and so that's kind of a smaller scale. That was over about a 10 county area. At the same time, the, all the LCCs in South Florida were um, working on mapping basically the whole Southeast. So those, those LCCs, I mean, not South Florida, all the LCCs in the Southeast, um, six LCCs came together and we're helping develop the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy, which is a giant blueprint that covers pieces of 16 states. And so we used our scenarios and some of our conservation target work um, to incorporate into that. And then, and then about that time, once again, focusing on the keys, we were being asked some very specific questions about adaptation. And so we developed a project um, uh, with Florida Keys Threatened Endangered Species, 21 to be exact, Here's some representative samples, some butterflies, some small mammals, um, and then, like I said, 21 species, numerous plants. Um, this adaptation project um, covered all the keys 
we slam model the keys and we use one, two, three, and four feet of sea level rise, those scenarios. And we're actually just about done with that report, uh, looking at what kind of strategies, what kind of triggers, uh, when, when it gets really tough for those different species. And what's really interesting is in the southern keys, the part that just got hit hardest by Irma, uh, three feet of sea level rise pretty much put that whole area underwater permanently. And so many of those species are, are, are highly endangered and, and, and right on the brink of extinction. The LCC also is using the scenarios to help us with our, with our conservation targets. We're, um, we're, we're developing oh, somewhere between 40 and 60 conservation targets as we speak. Um, and then the goal is to take those conservation targets and um, use impact assessments on those targets to determine ultimately develop our landscape conservation design. The scenarios that will help be help use, useful in guiding um, what those impacts will be on the different targets, urbanization and, and sea level rise temperature changes and precipitation, all previously used in these scenarios, uh, will, will be really important with impact assessments. And then last, I just want to mention some communication strategies. So, so during these nine years, we've, we, we've, we've tried a, a duff, number of different ways to, to disseminate these spin-off projects as well as the scenarios. Um, so we typical, you know, being good scientists, we've developed a lot of reports. Um, we probably have two dozen reports um, covering everything from focusing on, on actual scientific outputs and, and, and really, really structuring a lot of data to um, this report in the upper right corner was focused for managers. Um, it was a smaller report, but it, it really got into details of how the scenarios could be used for management implications. Uh, we also, in the, in the Resilient Land and Water Project, we used a story map, which, which I found story maps can be really effective when you're trying to communicate with the public and with managers. And so that story map was, was actually a very data-rich story map. Uh, had a lot of interesting data in it, as well as um, some video clips. Um, we, we looked at resilience, uh, resilience out of the future on, on, on using conservation in that part of the world. And that part of the world is probably one of potentially future most highly developed areas in Florida. And lastly, though, I think one of the things we found to be most effective um, in being able to convey a lot of this information to the widest audience is by developing a conservation planning atlas. And so all the LCCs um, in the country have conservation planning atlases. Half are, are done by CBI. Um, we're one of the ones that has CBI uh, putting together our, our planning atlas for us and then um, loading all the information and, and, and kind of uh, being the champions and shepherding that, that information. So this, I, this, there's just so much information in these atlases. Um, it's much of really unique and just covering all aspects of conservation in Florida, including the, the scenarios. All right, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of quick take-home messages today. I, I, I felt that, obviously, you know, this is a very quick overview of a nine-year um, process of, of, of building scenarios, incorporating them statewide. And I found scenarios are very useful for discussing very difficult problems. You know, these wicked problems that have a lot of answers, a lot of moving parts, scenarios do a really good job of. Um, but during that process, there's numerous tools and methods for getting through the challenges. And that's one of the things you're going to do, go through a lot of iterative processes, you're going to be throwing some curves during your scenario planning process, as well as, you know, the landscape conservation design process. There's a million ways to get through those challenges. And I, I, I tried to highlight a couple of, of different methods we used. Uh, good designs can lead to multiple spin-off projects. One of the reasons we picked such a small scale, and you can think about that, 100 meters, meters um, covering all of Florida is, is a really dense grid. But but by, by really having a small scale um, scenario size allows us to really be able to drill down, and so we can look at some of these, these these local areas. We can go to the county level or even even smaller. In fact, at one point we actually have all the parcels underlying our scenarios. And then what's really critical is coming up with communication strategies, and you need multiple communication strategies. You need some for the managers, some for the scientists, obviously for the stakeholders, and then for the, for your public audiences. And so being able to cover a wide range of different products. Um, to cover all those different communication needs are, are really important. And I love this quote, you know, we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Um, I look at my grandkids in the lower left corner, and, or two of the seven, and you know, just kind of remind myself that that's why we're in this work, that's why we're doing this, and planning for the future is really important when we're, when we're really throwing these, these wicked problems. And scenario planning is one I found highly useful tool in doing that. I want to thank you guys for listening to on this today, and if there's any questions, glad to take them.
Thank you so much, Steve. Um, folks, if you have questions, you could go ahead and type them in the chat box. Um, as a reminder, we will record this and post it on our YouTube channel. And Steve, currently there is one question already in the chat box. From the scenario projections, is there any one worst case scenario that was identified? If so, did it also reflect maximum conservation action or needs? Yeah, so that's a great question. So when I when I went back to that, when we were looking at those two half Florida scenarios, the South Florida scenarios, the, the scenario C was kind of the worst case that the stakeholders came up with, and that was um, at that time two meters of sea level rise, um, doubling of population, low financial resources, and then continuing on this post sprawl or business as usual um, development. And 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 if you remember back to that that slide, there was hardly any conservation that came out of that scenario. And, and, and that's a big fear, you know. I, so when I've given this talk, I used to show just on the east part of, of the talk, we, we've gone up in population 1.5 million people just in three counties, uh, Miami-Dade, Broward, and, and Palm Beach, in those nine years since I've been giving this talk. So we're, we're losing a lot of conservation opportunities very quick. And what that worst case scenario showed that, that if we don't do something soon, if we don't change our policy assumptions, and really get active on conservation, uh, we're going to lose just some huge opportunities and probably lose a number of, of, of potential species and habit, habitats in South Florida. Great question. I appreciate it. That's why I call those the bookend scenarios. Scenario B was kind of the opposite. That was the other end of the extreme spectrum where, you know, we had, we had a proactive policy. We had plenty of financial resources, minimal sea level rise, and we were really able to go out and get good conservation. Thank you, Steve. Um, the next question that we have is, among your stakeholders, how did you address and include private landowners? Yeah, good question. So Florida has a really active uh, focus on private landowners. We have, we have some really, really large ranches still. In fact, I think there's 22 entities that own 22% of the state still. We have a couple of ranches and groups in the, in the 300 to 600,000 acre category. I think there's a couple of timber groups in South Florida. And so we, those are done more on focal meetings. It's oftentimes hard to get those at the, at the more of the stakeholder workshops we had. Sometimes they would send representatives. Um, but, but so those are, those are often done more in the one-on-one -on -one focal communities or meetings. And at one point, the, the, the gentleman from MIT, and by the way, they, they both now own their own companies, GeoDesign and GeoAdaptive. Um, so they, they, they continue on to do this type of work. But they went out and they met with all county planners um, I, pretty, I think they covered all the county planners in 67 counties in Florida, and then they also met with many of these large entities or types of stakeholders. It's, it's hard, obviously, to, to get everybody, but what you want to do is try and target some of the champion landowners when, whenever you can, and, uh, and we have some really good ones in Florida. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, the next question is, I assume that some of the scenario results presented overwhelmingly bad news to managers. For example, there's no purpose in managing for this species here because it's going to be underwater anyway. Have you experienced a range in response to the scenarios? And if so, how have you responded to that feedback? Do people that receive really bad news stay engaged or involved? Yeah, so, wow. And so, I that Keys project I was just telling you about, the, the, the Keys Threat and Endangered Species Adaptation Project, as you can imagine, you know, uh, long before three feet of sea level rise, we'll actually start losing parts of the habitats in the Keys. And, and, and that day probably isn't that far away. So, so that's a tough one. We're actually trying to develop a workshop this winter uh, to help us teach people how to make decisions when there are no good decisions available, which is, I think, the exact question you just asked. Many of the people, um, some managers, uh, you know, they'll, they'll basically fall on the sword of the very last organism. Other managers want to go and focus on other areas where, where we have a chance to do good conservation. So um, I think what I like using the scenarios for is to allow that conversation to happen. Um, because when people see these, it, it, it definitely raises your eyebrow. And, and a lot of it depends on, and, and that's why when I talked about um, to understand the small scale, you have to understand the large. The larger your area is, the more you can then focus on where the true conservation needs to be. If you're only working in the Keys, then all your conservation would happen in the Keys. But if you have a statewide picture and you have representatives from the state, the part of the conversation may be 
Maybe we don't focus on the Keys. Maybe we focus on elsewhere, like Central Florida. So that's where um, kind of scale is really important in those conversations. And, and yeah, I think the service needs to have these type of conversations more and more in the future, and they're not easy. They're, they're really difficult. Great. Thank you. Um, our next question is, much of the human population growth in Florida comes from retirees or other out-of-state folks who may not be familiar with or appreciate Florida ecosystems. Given this, how are different human attitudes towards conservation considered in the scenario planning process? Wow, another really great question. So Florida actually, you're right, all right, so Florida has, has a large group of that, but in 2016, Florida had the most aggressive conservation amendment ever passed, Amendment 1. It basically sets aside 33% of dock stamp taxes, which is about $900 million in Florida. Now, the legislature has chosen not to, not to use that for direct conservation at this point in time, but hopefully that will be changed. So, so we have about $900 million a year that could go into some type of direct conservation. And, and I think the critical message there is that most Floridians understand that, you know, conservation is really important. These shifting baselines of getting these new people and, and moving to Florida and not seeing what Florida looked like historically, that, that is a huge issue. Um, and so, you know, you've got to kind of balance that with almost a hind casting or, or, or being able to show people through uh, effective communication tools. And to me, a story map is, is one methodology of doing that, showing what it used to look like, what it looks like now, and what it could look like in the future is a good way of projecting that. Because most people, I don't think people really realize that we continue on pro sprawl. You know, do you really want all of, or a good chunk of South Florida to be paid? I don't think people are moving down here for that. They're moving down here for other reasons. And so we have to be able to balance that with, with effective communication tools. That's a, and you guys are asking some really hard questions that there's no really good answers for at this point in time. So one of the reasons we like to have these webinar series so that we can learn. Oh, yeah, no, those are great questions. It, it's it's that's that question happens a lot in Florida right now and actually continuing with the same theme so continuing with retiree settlement how interested are they in investing in long-term conservation you know especially when their children are still in Michigan for example and they came to Florida to escape high taxes yeah so so but but also they may have escaped to high taxes but also many of them come down here you know what do you think when you think of Florida you think of beaches you think of you know, water life, you think of, like you said, lower taxes, but you still want those those things to be able to go out and utilize those resources. I think they've, they've done some studies where, although many people in Florida have never gone to the other place, they still want to know that they're there. And the other thing about good conservation is water is going to be one of the critical battles of the future. Without doing this type of conservation, especially like protecting large wetlands like the Everglades, we're going to have some real issues with water in the future. And so we want to keep our, our lifestyle, our urban lifestyle, as well as our agricultural lifestyle, ranching, cattle, um, you know, citrus, that kind of thing. We're going to have to be able to battle, be able to encompass all of those needs. And, and conservation is a big factor um, in being able to do that. Thanks, Steve. Um, again, folks, if you have other questions, go ahead and type them in. And then, Steve, I actually have a question. Um, in terms of what you looked at in scenario planning and how it affected conservation strategies in light of the recent hurricanes that have occurred um, and predictions, of course, for increased hurricane, um, strength of hurricanes into the future, has that affected how people are looking at these scenarios or increased interest in these scenarios? And if so, um, how or could you use these to kind of help address some of those concerns in the future? Yeah, the, the, the short answer to the last part of that question is yes. And that project I mentioned, the one that was rolled out the White House, the Resilience Project, that resilience um, that we talked about in Southwest Florida is, is twofold. One is for water of the future and kind of their way of life. But the second, the big, the big discussion we see in numerous workshops in here is, is how to protect this urban Urban, these urban areas, especially from things like future hurricane issues, or, or just to be honest, you know, I showed that, that with the octopus in the parking garage, just normal king tides. These, these king tides now, you know, 15, 20 years ago, they were maybe one, then it went to two a year, and now it's two, four, five, six, seven a year. There's places in the Keys where these king tides are covering roads nine, ten times a year. I've seen projections, the higher the sea level comes up, 
Um, the more these king tide events we're going to get, this flooding becomes more and more common. And then when you overlay a 100-year storm or, or God forbid, a, a hurricane like, like Irma over that, um, you, you tend to cause, you know, huge problems, especially on the terrestrial side, as well as all the damage that it does to the urban sectors. So those conversations are happening. I see them more on the resilience side from the urban communities, but at the same time, people are starting to realize that things like mangroves and other aspects of the salt marsh are, are critical to helping us um, build these. You, you, get, you get one part of the population down here that thinks we're going to engineer our way out of it, and um, that's a nice thought, but I just with sea level rise and, and potentially increase intensity of hurricanes, I, I, I think that, that that may be part of the conversation, but hopefully people will stray away from that. Good question, Jennifer. Um, any other questions from folks on the line? Um, well, with that, if you if you have any questions, of course, please feel free to contact um, me or Matt, and we will try to get that answered. Um, Steve's email is also on the screen which is awfully nice of him. So <laughs> folks, if you have questions, you want to talk to him directly, um, you can use that. Steve, I just want to thank you um, and Todd again today, um, knowing, of course, that you guys have been dealing with some weather issues um, and still being able to present this webinar for us. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, as everybody knows, we've been trying to hold series uh, um, landscape conservation design because the desert LCC is going through a similar process and we want to learn, um, be able to maybe realize those things that um, we can't answer well, but we know others are struggling with it as well. And so again, thank you. Thank you to everybody who attended today. We had several folks on the group chat also say thank you um, that this is really applicable to other LCCs and helpful to stimulate thought and thank you again for your responses to of course some challenging questions that we're all struggling with. So right. thank you and everybody have a great day. Appreciate it. Thanks.